guys. All right. Well, as Jeff said, I'm Emily Gannon. I'm one of the attorneys here at K Bender. Um, I've been here over eight years. I've been practicing 15 years. I know I look like a baby. We'll let that go. I graduated law school at the age of 10. Let's pretend. Um, now, today's topic, let me, let me give you a little disclaimer here. It is about updating your governing documents. Now, it's meant to be sort of a, a overall informational session. So if you have particular questions about your association, if you're going to write a, a, a comment or a question that says, you know, Mr. Smith in Unit 101 keeps doing X, Y, Z, we need help, um, that's not really a general question. So try and keep to general informational type questions. I can't give you specific legal advice, you know, via this lovely webcam here. Um, so this is just, again, meant to be informational. If you're a client of ours, hi, good to sort of see you. Um, and again, if you have questions later, you can always reach out to me. You can always reach out to us. Um, we do a lot of webinars. You guys probably know if you're on our uh, list, you probably get email blasts all the time. We have information on our website, additional articles that you can go to. You can look there for extra information. So. Again, today's topic covers sort of a smorgasbord of, of topics within it. So some of these things we may touch on, we may not go into too much detail on them. And again, we may, I may tell you, hey, we also offer a class on this, just this one topic that you may want to think about or you may want to look at our website for. So, so today's topic is about amending your docs, jumping into the present, as we say. So we'll, we'll start with our first slide here, the hierarchy of governing documents. So, and I apologize for the shorthand when I say docs, when we say governing docs, we mean your governing documents. Now for condominium, that's your declaration of condominium, articles of incorporation, bylaws, then any rules and regulations you may have. And that's the hierarchy and that's why we put it in that order. So if there's a conflict between your articles and your bylaws, for example, which comes up on occasion, sometimes your articles say something like, you know, the board is to be governed by six direct or, you know, three directors and then the bylaws will say anywhere from three to seven. And then the board will say, well, the bylaws say three to seven, so we can, we can decide on five. But if your articles already said you're supposed to have three, then you're stuck with the three because the articles win. Um, homeowners Association, it's a declaration usually of covenants, restrictions, um, covenants and easements, they, the names can vary obviously. Articles of incorporation, bylaws, then rules and regulations and, and any guidelines you have about architectural um, information. Um, before we move on to this next slide, let me just also mention for co-ops, and I don't know if we have any co-op uh, owners on here, but you guys have, you're a little different. You have a proprietary lease. I just wanted to mention that it's not on the slide. And then you also have bylaws. Now, governing documents in general, again, we're just going to sort of use that as the term for today. Um, but we may be talking about different uh, individual documents when, when we are talking. Your documents do differ. They have different purposes. Your declaration, whether it's condominium or covenants, generally has your restrictions that's where your you know uh sales lease rental information would be that's where your vehicle restrictions would be that's where if you're uh, a 55 and over community those restrictions would be in there your articles typically just set up the corporation with the state and sometimes involve how many directors you'll have that type of thing your bylaws typically then cover meetings notices how many directors qualification for directors those, those issues. So they do have different purposes. Sometimes things can be located in different spots, but we'll see as we go through. Um, and certain restrictions are required or certain information are, are required to be in different documents. Sometimes some older documents have, you know, stuff in their bylaws where really it should be in the declaration or, or vice versa. So that's something to look at as well. And that's something that may come up. Now, when we talk about rules, before we get to the amendment process, and I'll get to this in, in two seconds, when we talk about rules, it's important to note that there was a recent change in 2018 for HOAs because we get questions, what are our rules? Where are our rules? Do our rules have to be recorded? Our board has you know, policies that they say they enforce, but we don't even know where they come from. 
um, a lot of associations have rules that weren't recorded at some point in time. Um, that's pretty normal. Condominiums, there's prop, there's usually a set, there's a handout, and sometimes they get changed, you know, along the way. For HOAs, this is important because in 2018 there was a change to how to the language in the statute when we were talking about amendments, and that's how we we get to this next slide here um, that we're looking at. Now, for amendments, you're supposed to amend your documents in a certain way with a strike through if you're taking language out, underline if you're adding language, and and the statute was changed to include rules and regulations to be a defined part of your governing documents. And that term is then referenced in the amendment process of the statute where amendments to be effective, amendments have to be recorded and they have to be done in that certain way. So they have to be recorded in, in your, your public records, whether it's Broward, Palm Beach or, or Miami, whatever county you guys are located in. Now for HOAs, like I said, because they put rules and regulations as part of the governing document definition, now that means really in HOA world, your rules and regulations should be recorded. So we recommend because you're, anytime you amend them, the amendment should be recorded. Really, maybe you want to do a new set of rules. Maybe you want to amend what you already have. And from this point on, since that changed, really they should be recorded. So there's no question of what your rules are. And also to comply with the statute so you don't run into people challenging you and saying your rules were supposed to be recorded. And if you try and enforce that rule against me and it wasn't recorded, you know, it's not, it wasn't enforceable. You don't want to, you don't want to come up against that. Another thing to point out before we get into this with too much more detail, one of the items that'll come up when we're talking about amendments is, you know, the statute and how the statutes come into play. For condominiums, we're talking about chapter 718 of Florida statutes. For co-ops, it's 719. For HOAs, it's 720. There is also chapter 617. That's the uh, not-for-profit statute. So that is sometimes something we have to fall back on. Sometimes that fills in the gaps for, for, um, for us if something's not covered in the other, the other statutes. Now, we always get the question, so our docs say this, but the statute says this, which one wins, essentially? And unfortunately, that's a, that's a tough question to answer, and I can't really give you a, a fast and, and uh, easy, straightforward response for that. It will come down to a couple different things. What the restriction is, what is whether the change is procedural versus whether the change is substantive um, and that's that alone is sometimes tricky to figure out in the world of condos the easiest example i can give you is your documents may have a whole election process outlined but yet we don't follow that we don't follow the election process that would be in your documents for a condominium we only follow what's in the statute because that was considered procedural so the statute wins if you will so that's where you follow the statute not your documents but there are other examples where you follow your documents and not the statute and again it's tricky depends on what we're talking about and and we can get into a little bit more of that as we go another thing to consider with the with the statute is uh kaufman language and that comes from a case called the kaufman case where essentially if your governing documents have language in there that submit them to the statute as it is amended from time to time, and that's the key language, as amended from time to time, your governing documents will change with the statute. So you can use the changes in the statute instead of whatever the statute was at the time your, your documents were established. Now, generally that's beneficial. Um, not always, so you want to be careful, but generally as the statutes get uh, revised, there are more protections and, and it's beneficial for the association to incorporate the newer language. Um, and again, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more of that in a minute. So that's language that you may want to put in your governing documents if it's not there already. That's the first thing we would sort of tell you to look for. So that's called Kaufman language. And that's the, as it may be amended from time to time, 
usually it's in the beginning of your documents where it will say, you know, this community is subject to Chapter 718, the Condominium Act. Then you want to make sure it says, as it may be amended from time to time, so it's not, you're not locked into what the Condominium Act said in 1999, or even worse, you know, 1975. Um, all right, so the amendment process. So I told you that one was going to be a little long. Sorry about that. Now, thing to notice, wait, go back, <laughs> um, is there is a five-year statute of limitations on the challenges to recorded amendments. So essentially, if there was an amendment and 10 years later, somebody comes back to you and says, wait a second, I don't think that amendment was properly adopted. I don't think they got the right votes or whatever it is. If, it, if it's past the five years, it's, it's safe if you will. Can't be challenged five years once it's recorded, it, you're locked in and can't be challenged anymore. Um, your amendment threshold, this is something we also want to talk about when we're talking about the amendment process. For most governing documents, there's probably something in there and it may differ between your deck, your articles, your bylaws, and odds are your rules and regulations, but again we'd have to look at them, are probably uh, you know, it probably can be amended by just a board vote, but you'd have to check, but probably just a board vote. The declaration articles and bylaws are going to be different. Odds are in there, there's, you know, some provision that it's going to be a two thirds vote, 75% vote of the membership, maybe a majority. Um, if you do have older language and it is a really high threshold like that, 75% or two thirds um, to get any amendments adopted, obviously that is that's going to be your first obstacle. So that's the first thing you want to tackle if you're thinking about adopting amendments. You want to potentially look at that first. What, what would it take for us to amend the declaration? If it takes 75%, if it takes two thirds, maybe think about modifying that and presenting that as an amendment first. So that would be sort of phase one, if you will. Get that amendment going where you're, you present to the membership we're thinking about adding some changes. We're thinking about updating our docs. First step is we want to bring the voting threshold down. So we want to go from needing 75% or two thirds or whatever that provision is. We're going to bring it down to a majority, which is usually palatable to the community. Or even better, maybe you want to say a majority of, uh, you know, in person or by proxy at a meeting at which quorum is obtained, which could be an even lower number. Sometimes communities get a little freaked out by that because they're not entirely sure what that means. But you, if you majority is usually sort of a safe bet. But if you want to make it even lower, majority of uh, at a meeting and present in person by proxy at which quorum is obtained is an even better threshold or even lower threshold, easier to get to. So that's the first thing you want to look at. Now. If you, there are a couple things to keep in mind though. If you're a condo, there are certain things that you're not gonna be able to, to change in that way. There are certain, and this is in the statute and, and you're sort of locked in. If you wanted to change the percentage of common expenses or appurtenances, um, you would need 100% approval. You might need your lien holders to vote as well or to consent to the, the change as well. So that's gonna be very hard. You can't, can't get around that. You're not gonna be able to amend that away. The way that would come up, we had this recently in an association where they had, and I'll, I'll give you a hypothetical, they had 100 units and 10 of them were three bedrooms. So in the board's mind and in the declaration, everybody was paying the same amount, same assessment across the board. But in the board's mind, it would make more sense. And, it, and, and I could see the logic, I understood it completely that those 10 unit owners who have a three bedroom, maybe they should pay a little bit more. So can we change the assessments so that we make those 10 pay, pay more? And I had to inform them that ultimately the way that you're assessed has to do with your percentage of ownership of the common elements. And you can't do it without changing that. And to amend that, you need 100%. So it's, it's almost impossible. So just a heads up, that is one, one area where odds of getting an amendment are, are not good for you. But now other things you want to keep in mind if you are thinking about presenting the amendments, are you going to do it at a meeting? Are you going to do it by written approval? Are you going to use proxies? That's most likely the easiest way to do it. If you're an HOA, 
you can, might be able to do it by written consent. You could just do it by a mailing. You don't even need to have a meeting. If you're a condo, you have to look at your docs to see if that's something you can do as well. Otherwise, proxies are probably your, your easiest bet there. You have to send a copy to the members, make sure they know what they're voting on. Um, another thing to keep in mind listed here, the leasing rentals condo only sort of exception. In section 718.1110 subsection 13, there is a special provision, and again, this is only condos, not HOAs, and not co-ops, that if you are adopting an amendment that will alter the rental term or it specifies the numbers, the number of times an owner can lease the unit, um, it, it, there's sort of a statutory grandfathering, if you will. So that type of amendment will only apply to the owners who, who voted in favor or owners who take title after the effective date of the amendment. So that's something to keep in mind because that's, that's a little unusual. That's one of those sort of weird caveats, if you will. So we just wanted to bring that to your attention. Suspension of voting rights, that's important as well. If we're talking about trying to get, you know, as many votes as you can and get people involved, if you have some owners who are delinquent, who, uh, you know, are ultimately you don't think they're gonna vote in favor anyway, because they're probably not very involved in your community, I'm guessing, you could suspend their voting rights. And then you, you take them out of the mix in terms of numbers for quorum, numbers that you need to, to get this vote going. So that's another thing, that's another tool you have to sort of help you hopefully get the amendments going. Because one of the questions we always get without fail is, these are great ideas, but we can't get anybody involved. We can't get anyone to adopt anything, to agree to anything, to show up to any meetings. And I, I know, and there's only so much I can do and there's only so much I can tell you guys to do because that's the, that's the battle we're really fighting with these amendments. That's why we think, you know, reducing your voting threshold, that's step number one, but you do need the higher threshold to get that, adopt, that amendment adopted. So it may involve knocking on doors, talking to friends, you know, holding town halls, whatever you can do, although right now can't really do that, but virtual town halls. Um, things like that. You may have to sort of, you know, get a, a, a feet on the ground movement and, and get people involved. So suspension of voting rights, that's something where you get to sort of change your numbers a bit because you can take some owners out of the mix. So for an HOA, that's if an owner is more than 90 days delinquent and you do that at a board meeting, send them notice, and now their voting rights are suspended and then they come out of the, the tally for quorum purposes as well. For condos, it's a little bit different. They have to be 90 days delinquent, but it has to be at least $1,000. And it, you have to have given them proof of the debt 30 days before the effective date of the suspension. So little different, but again, that is something that may come in handy. You may, you know, that may help you at least, uh, you know, increase your odds of getting the amendment passed. Mortgagee approval is the last thing listed here. Something to keep in mind. A lot of governing documents do have language where if you're trying to amend certain provisions, if you're doing something that will affect a, a mortgagee's rights, um, and maybe that has something to do with foreclosure, and we'll get into foreclosure in a minute, um, you may be required to get mortgagee approval as well. Now, that sounds like a, a real uphill battle, obviously, but the statutes, both 718 and 720, have incorporated basically a, a, a mail out consent type process where it's it's almost a negative notice. You let the you have to run title searches, you get all the lien information, you send out a, a mailing to these mortgages, and uh, and basically if they don't respond, it's considered their consent. Um, so that's something there is a statutory method for doing that. If you don't do it, and you, you adopt an amendment that was supposed to have done that, um, there is the possibility that a lender will come back and challenge it and say, hey, you weren't supposed to amend that because you didn't get, or you weren't supposed to amend that without mortgagee approval, you didn't get mortgagee approval. And now, now we're gonna say, you know, we're challenging the enforceability of it. But it would only have to be, that would only, that would only be a valid claim from a mortgagee. And so odds of that happening, hmm, probably not so, not so high. An individual owner wouldn't apply to, to them. And again, 
you have the five-year statute of limitations in there. So if that amendment's been in place for five years, and then a lender comes back to you and says, hey, you didn't do the mortgagee approval process the way you were supposed to, if it's been five years, they're out of luck. All right. Now, the way we did this, we sort of have a true false thing going on, but it's, uh, it's just to, again, touch on sort of the hot topics for, for amending your docs. So common misconceptions is where we start. What provisions are legal? What provisions are holding you back or costing you money? Now, before we really dive into this, I just want to touch on, obviously, the, the biggest topic of right now, COVID-19, coronavirus, global pandemic. What does this mean for you guys? Now, again, there have been many webinars on them. I know our office is doing them, I think, almost weekly. So make sure you check our website. And there are just webinars based solely on coronavirus, COVID-19, and how to operate during this time. But I'll just address sort of a tiny portion of it, which is how does that come into play with when we're talking about amending your docs, for example. So something that, that we've said, you know, there was a big debate, and I, again, I won't go into too many details or the big history here, but there was a big debate about the state of emergency declared by the governor for Florida and what that means for associations, what that meant for the boards, do they have emergency powers? And the consensus is essentially yes. The, the statute, and it, there's a portion of 718, a portion 719, and a portion 720 that talk about these emergency powers. And basically, even though we know the statutes were written originally to deal with damage from hurricanes and to deal with hurricanes, we generally the consensus among the, the you know, legal mind seems to be this applies in this case as well. We are still in a state of emergency we think the boards are, are able to exercise these emergency powers. However, since we've now sort of learned this lesson and what this means in these emergency powers, we do suggest, if possible, you may want to incorporate some of these emergency powers into your bylaws, for example. Um, and again, Jeff Rembaum wrote an article recently that's up on our website, going into this into a lot more detail in the history of, of the story there. And basically, if you can, if you are thinking about doing amendments at this point in time, because of what we've now learned, why not incorporate some of these, these changes? The easiest and, and most obvious change, everyone right now is doing you know, their meetings via Zoom, for example. So we say, you know, why don't you have an amendment, put it in your bylaws that you can hold board meetings, you can hold meet membership meetings if, if needed, um, via Zoom, via some other online platform, something like that. Now, again, you've always been allowed to have meetings where people could appear telephonically as long as you could hear them and, and all of that. But, but let's, you know, let's really lock that in and, and mention in there that you're going to use these, these platforms, these online platforms, and that you could host meetings in this way. Um, we think that makes sense. That's been sort of a big, again, lesson learned, I suppose. Um, Another thing here where we say which provisions are illegal, let's touch on that a little bit and we'll get into some details in a minute, but fair housing is, is a big question here. So fair housing language, you wanna be careful about fair housing restrictions. A lot of times your documents may have certain information or certain old language essentially that if you enforced would, would be problematic. Um, there's you know governing documents that still have language, even if you're a 55 and over community, you should have age restrictions that comply with fair housing and that, you know, essentially say that one of your permanent occupants needs to be at least 55 years of age and no one under 18 can permanently reside in the unit. That's typically the, the fair housing language, essentially, in a nutshell. But there are some communities that had older language before the fair housing language was, was incorporated where they had language in there that it's no one under 16 instead of no one under 18 um, or, or, you know, other, other things that could be problematic because essentially if it doesn't comply to fair housing or it's more restrictive than the fair housing requirements, now you're potentially adding that liability where you shouldn't be enforcing that. You can't be enforcing that. Um, you know, if it's, if fair housing says, 18 is your cutoff, then your documents can't say 16, or you're, you'll run into a possible discrimination issue. 
Um, we've also seen it, and again, it'll come up in a minute with some rules and other provisions that you may have that, that you don't realize are, are um, potentially discriminatory and that someone could raise a challenge for. And if you deal with the discrimination claim, it can be very expensive to defend and it can be, um, it can be very uh, frustrating to defend. Let's just say that. All right, what provisions are holding you back or costing you money? I think the good one to, uh, to transition to that is to just go to the next slide here and we'll talk about this first question we have here. Foreclosing lender is required to pay 1% or 12 months of delinquent assessments. True or false? We're not live, or at least I can't see you guys, so I can't see if you're, what your answer would be. And you can see the answer right there. So false. Now, in theory, that, is, that sounds correct. A lender is supposed to pay 1%, 12 months of delinquent assessments. Okay, that's safe harbor, right? What's safe harbor? So here's the problem. That is what safe harbor says, essentially, but your governing documents might have language that is actually more restrictive than that. And some time ago, and this is where that Kaufman language would come in handy as well, some time ago, a lot of uh, the safe harbor provision was, was, was six months. So, you know, keep in mind that was one of those changes to the statute that, that benefits the association and gets the association more money. But if your documents don't change with the times, if you will, then you're stuck with whatever you have in your governing documents. So if your declaration does not say that, your declaration might have been written when, when the statute said six months. And so maybe at the time, your developer or counsel thought, okay, so we'll just say six months in our declaration because that's what the statute says. Well, now you're stuck with that six months. Worse yet, it may say you get nothing if the first lender forecloses. And so if you are stuck with that language, then you might be stuck with that language and now you're losing out. The safe harbor that's in the statute is 1% or 12 months. And if you want to be able to get that, you need to make sure you either have that Kaufman language or better yet, Kaufman language and amend your, your, your provision in there to make sure it conforms to what's in the statute and that you don't have anything that's more restrictive so that you could get your you know, maximum possible recovery. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and also it, it will depend on if it's the mortgagee, a first lender or first mortgage lender, or possibly a third party that purchases at a first mortgage foreclosure. And those are different, they have different rights as well. But your documents may say that that third party investor you know, one, two, three ABC investments that purchased at the, you know, Bank of America sale is entitled to the same benefit that Bank of America would have gotten. Whereas if you can, if you amend your docs, you can make sure, hey, wait a minute, that's only that, that privilege, if you will, only goes to Bank of America because they were the first mortgage holder and they foreclosed if they had purchased it. But since that one, two, three ABC investor purchased they're a third party, they don't get any privilege, they should pay everything that's owed. So that's one of those examples where the association, without realizing it, may be limiting their recovery and there may be sort of money for you guys to possibly recover or additional monies that you could be recovering if you had the right language in your governing documents. So that's one that you definitely wanna look at. All right, next slide. Landscaped grass lawns must cover the bulk of the front yards in our HOA. This is also false. And this will get us into a couple different topics here. So Florida statutes prohibit enforcement of governing documents from preventing a property owner from installing Florida friendly landscaping. So, you know, sort of that desert friendly landscaping. Now that's allowed, have to allow it. Statute, statute's gonna trump your docs there. Um, if you're an HOA, you have to allow it. Now and this, this will, let's see, do we go into it? All right, there's gonna be a similar one down the road that, that's related to this, but, but we'll keep going and then we'll, we'll circle back. Go ahead. Another one that we'll just touch on quickly, the board has sole discretion uh, making power when it comes to filing lawsuits, um, mostly false. So there's a statute that basically says can't sue the developer um, 
prohibits commencing litigation against any party where the amount in controversy is over $100,000 unless the members vote to authorize that. So generally, the board does have power to make these decisions. Um, if we're talking about maybe a foreclosure lawsuit or a, a typical covenant enforcement type lawsuit, generally that's just gonna be a board decision. But here there is an exception, so just keep that in mind. Next one. All new owners go through the screening process in our community. And then we say false. Many of the mortgagee protection clauses prohibit the association from screening anyone that buys from a mortgagee. So let me explain that a little bit more. Typically, there is an exception when there is a lender foreclosure and someone buys the property at that lender foreclosure sale. Not always. But usually, so if you're, again, if you were ABC123 Investment Corp and they buy at that, that lender sale, um, you may not have the ability to screen them, run their background checks, any of that. Um, sometimes there's an exception for the lender to purchase. So if in that scenario, Bank of America had been the one who ended up taking title at their own foreclosure, sometimes there's also an exception for them to sell to whoever they want. And you can't, you can't screen them, you can't review the, pro, the application, you can't require it, they can sell to whoever they want to, or they can lease to whoever they want to. That one tends to come up a lot. That's one of the items you wanna look for, you wanna check. Another one that comes up much more often is now if you do have sale lease approval in your documents, and this is one of those topics that I'll, I'll give you a heads up. We do a full hour long class just on sale lease approval and screening and guests and occupancy because it is, it is a uh, more complicated topic than you would think. So again, that's something that we could talk about for an hour alone. So I know you guys may have many questions and if you, this is usually where the very, very specific hypotheticals come out. Um, but we'll, we'll touch on those at the end. But to keep in mind, if you're going to review sales and leases at all, you want to make sure you actually have the authority to do that. And that authority comes from your governing documents. If you're going to review a sale and if you're going to potentially disapprove a sale, that is, that's a, that's a, that's a big decision. Potentially you're you know, stopping someone from selling their unit, selling their home, and that's a, a protection that is, is valued. So in order to do that, you have to have the authority in your docs, to have the authority properly in your documents, if we're talking about sales, to review sales, you also need the right of first refusal to be, to be in there. Otherwise, your ability to review those sales might not be what you think it is, might not be enforceable. And if you deny a sale when you didn't have that authority, you may now be dealing with an owner who, who has suffered serious damages because you caused this sale to fall through and now they lost thousands of dollars in, in a buyer that you didn't have the authority to disapprove. So make sure, that's one of those that we wanna make sure you really do have the authority that you think you do. And uh, we've had clients who have come to us and said, you know, oh yeah, we review all the sales. Of course we do, we run background checks, got it. And then when we looked through their docs, we said, well, you don't actually have the authority to do that. So I hope you haven't rejected anybody, um, or at least in, in that case, it hadn't come back yet. So, or, you know, hadn't come up yet. The other thing to look at is we say, look at the words very carefully. So does your provision talk about sales and leases? Does it talk about, does it just say purchaser? Does it just say buyer? These will come in uh, to play if we're talking about someone who wants to do a transfer via a quick claim deed. So there's really no purchase, there's no buyer, um, they're just doing a transfer. So is it every transfer, is it just a sale? Is it if you're adding someone to your deed essentially? So if, if, if you have one owner who now wants to include their, their spouse, do you have exceptions for inter-family uh, transfers? you have to look at what your governing documents say and make sure that they match what you want to be able to do. So if you want to review every transfer, even if it's interfamily, and I say that only because most communities will say, well, but we have this exception if it's interfamily, but it will always come up when it's, you know, an owner who wants to give the property to their convicted felon son or something. So 
I say that just maybe you want to review every transfer and maybe that's a good idea and make sure that your governing documents again have that language and cover every possible scenario for you if that's what you want. So you may need to amend your documents because maybe your documents don't cover every scenario. Maybe they only say buyer, maybe they only say purchaser and it doesn't include a quit claim deed or a transfer via an inheritance, for example. Because again, there's no purchase there, there's no buyer there. Um, if it's a, you wanna make sure again, that you're, you're covered and that language is in your governing documents. The last one, what are your responsibilities with respect to screening? And this is a, this again covers a, a, a bunch of issues here. Do you want to be able to interview these people or do you just wanna do it via, you know, the, an application? If you want to interview them, we would suggest that the authority to specifically interview be included in your, your process so be in the governing documents if you are a condominium and you want to charge a security deposit if we're talking about leases and tenants that you're screening for example now if you're going to charge a security deposit the statute says that the authority to charge that security deposit has to be contained in your declaration or in your bylaws if you don't have that authority in there and you're charging a security deposit someone might come back to you and say, you really don't have the ability to charge a security deposit. So why are you doing that? Um, has to be in your deck or in your bylaws. That's in the world of condominiums. Another condominium specific issue is a transfer fee. If you are running background checks, if you're running credit checks, his, you know, criminal history checks, all of this stuff. And I know I get it. A lot of those, those, uh, those, um, programs or, or those companies charge you $200, $150, $175 to run those, but you are limited. If you're in a condo, you can only charge $100 as part of a transfer fee. So your application fee, if you're in a condominium, should not exceed $100, and that's per applicant, except for husband, wife, and, and child dependent are considered, parent dependent are each considered just one. Um, there's no limit in HOAs, so you don't have that same sort of handcuff, if you will. But to run that background check, and again, I know sometimes it means ultimately it, a little bit of that cost might come out of your pockets as, as a board because you might be charged $200 to run that, that background check, but you can only charge that applicant $100 as part of the transfer fee. And that's in condo world. Now talking about the same, the same topic, sales, leases, and all of that, if you want to disapprove, you want to make sure that you have, in order to not have to exercise your right of first refusal, if we're talking about a sale, for example, you need to be able to say that, that this application doesn't comply with our governing documents. And that can be a straightforward, easy, easy question. If, it's, if you're a 55 and over community and a 30 year old applies and they indicate that they intend to live in the unit by themselves with nobody else, then that is pretty clear that they're going to be in violation with the governing documents because you can't be there unless you have a permanent occupant who's at least 55. Um, that would be a pretty easy one to deny. But now, if it's something, if we're talking now about finances, if we're talking about criminal history, you want to have good cause criteria outlined in your governing documents. And this is what we tell everybody. If you're, if you're thinking about having this authority, you want to outline your good cause criteria, which in there you put in what you're looking at when you run these applications, when you're screening. And that can't be anything that's based on any discriminatory, uh, you know, protected classes, obviously nothing based on, you know, age, race, uh, national origin, familial status. Those are all protected classes. It can't be related to those things. It has to be based on you know, finances, criminal history, whether this applicant has a history in the community and violated the rules previously. Those are all things you could factor in. You could put those in a policy as, as your good cause criteria and put them in your governing documents. That's where they're gonna be the strongest. Criminal history is something that um, we can talk about in further detail. You don't wanna have a policy that says, if there's any criminal history, we're denying you that is potentially discriminatory because it may have a discriminatory effect. Um, HUD had some, had some regulations and suggestions a couple years ago about how to handle criminal history. 
And basically, if you have something where you're looking at criminal history, you want to be looking at um, the seriousness of the crime, the recency of the crime, whether or not it was a conviction. And that's a big, that's a big one right there. Um, we have a lot of associations who will sort of do their own. Sometimes they do their own Google search. Uh, they look on the clerk's website or something and they find, they find that there were various charges and or even even it'll come up on the actual criminal report and they don't really know what they're reading they just see that there's this history there and you may need to get your legal counsel involved and to take a look and say hey wait a second this criminal history might look bad at, at first glance but they you know three of these are traffic tickets those don't really count one of these was a misdemeanor from 10 years ago the other charge was was a conviction was not a conviction they were the charges were dropped so if you're going to look at it on a case by case basis, but those are the factors you want to look at. So you can't just have a blanket policy of if any criminal history comes up or we're, we're denying you that we would not recommend doing that. That's a that's a bad policy to have in place. So good cause criteria. That's something you want to look at. You want to put in your your governing docs. All right, next slide. All right. This is something we touched on too. Once the law changes, the change is automatically applicable to your community. False. So again, there are instances where the law will apply. Generally, if the new law is procedural or remedial in nature, however, the law cannot change fundamental contract rights unless there's a compelling public policy need. So again, this is why we say you should put that Kaufman language in there or consider putting it in there um, because again, it will probably benefit you and you don't necessarily want to be locked into how the statutes were whenever your, your community was, was built. Residents are prohibited from having closed lines in your HOA. False. This is sort of a random one, but it's because it, it touches on a couple different things. So there is a statute that has to do with essentially energy and uh, renewable resources. So you can't prohibit, and so sorry, you can't prohibit people having closed lines in your HOA. You can have restrictions in terms of where they go, rules about, you know, maybe not in the front lawn, something like that. Solar panels too, this is more likely to come up. This has been a hot topic lately. A lot of communities, a lot of owners are, are now looking at solar panels and we've had boards come back and say, oh, solar panels, absolutely not. We don't allow those in our community. Well, you don't really have a choice now. So the statute is, you know, essentially protects the installation of solar panels, but you still have the ability to, to make some regulations, some rules in terms of where they go if, and again, it has to do with also making sure that they're still going to be effective. I understand a lot of communities don't want them on the, you know, sort of the front roof line where they're going to be easily visible from the street. But um, you have to see because it depends if that's the only spot that, you know, an engineer comes back and tells you this is the only place that a solar panel will work on this house. Otherwise, you know, it's not effective. It's not whatever, for whatever reason, whatever the location is of the house or, or whatever it may be, it may be that, that you have to allow it. So if you get an application, if you have architectural review, you know, an architectural review committee, you have guidelines. And as a quick aside, if you have an architectural review committee, you should have guidelines adopted already. If you're in an HOA and you have a committee set up, you do want to have those guidelines adopted. It should be adopted by your board and it should be done essentially as a rule and sent out to everyone so everyone knows what those guidelines are so that if someone comes back to you and says, oh, I want to paint my house, whatever it is, you know, dove white, you can say, oh, here are the approved colors. Yes, that's approved or no, that isn't approved. If you don't have those guidelines set up, you may run into issues where people go ahead and paint their house that you know bright blue and you come back and say well but they didn't get our approval and we don't allow blue houses and then i have to say to you do you have that in writing anywhere do you have guidelines that say we only allow these colors so just that's a note for our hoa listeners make sure you have architectural review guidelines in place Adopt those as rules. Make sure everybody knows that they're, that's what your requirements are going to be. Those are your restrictions. And then in terms of these specific guidelines, clothes lines and solar panels, hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you're going to have to allow them, but you could still have rules in terms of where they're located. So, all right. 
All right, this is one we touched on. Our community can enforce rules prohibiting minors from using any of the recreational facilities without an adult present. False. So this is where your fair housing rules are gonna come into play or your fair housing laws. So essentially, if you enforce rules that have a discriminatory effect, you may run into a discrimination claim and you may run into a little bit of a problem. Now, even with a 55 and over community, sometimes they'll have rules that are just at this point a little outdated and they'll have them posted or you know by the pool or they'll have them in their rule book and we've seen it where they have language you know anyone under 18 is prohibited from being in the pool without an adult or any minor without an adult can't be in the pool um, that's potentially an issue that's potentially discriminatory and it's discriminatory based on familial status families that have children all of that age issues so you want to be careful because that is that's that's where it'll come up and usually it's uh it comes up in in that with pools and that type of thing here you have to keep in mind if your rule your pool rule includes you know no one under 18 unsupervised well lifeguards can start training with the red cross and become certified lifeguards at the age of 15. so that rule doesn't really make sense so that's one of those things that a lot of communities just have old rules in place. And we say, you might wanna look at those two and have an attorney go through your rules and make sure your rules now are, are up to date and make sense. Otherwise, you may have somebody uh, bring in a discrimination claim against you. All right, board must obtain a vote of the owners before making any material alterations. False, but really it's sort of a maybe. Um, your governing documents are where we go first. So in the world of condominiums, if there's nothing in your governing documents about a material alteration and a material alteration, for example, you know, even figuring out whether something is a material alteration can be very tricky. If you're talking about, you know, knocking down a tennis court and building a second clubhouse, that pretty clearly would seem to be a material alteration. If we're talking about painting the clubhouse, changing the color of the paint. Is that a material alteration? And there was actually a division case that basically confirmed that, change, that changing the color of paint is a material alteration, even though most of us disagree and that seems to be very silly. But with that disclaimer, you should check with your attorneys if you're thinking of doing any material alterations to figure out A, if it's a material alteration, and then B, do you need a membership vote? Your governing documents in, H, in condo world, if your governing documents don't say anything, then you need a 75% vote approval of the membership to make any material alteration. There is an exception for necessary maintenance. So the case that we always talk about is uh, the seawall case where an association was, was located on the water, the seawall was crumbling, the board made the decision without getting a membership vote to replace, repair the seawall. Of course, as part of that, there was a special assessment adopted and an owner eventually challenged it, said, I don't wanna pay the special assessment. You didn't get a membership vote. It was a material alteration. I shouldn't have to pay, basically. Going through the procedural history, bottom line, court came back and said, it was necessary maintenance. That was a repair that had to be done to the common elements. So the board did not need to get membership vote, did not need to get membership approval, did not need to present the vote because it was necessary maintenance. So that's your exception. So even if, and in that case, the documents did say they would need a membership vote for this work. Even if your documents say that, if this is necessary maintenance, if this is a repair that has to be done to the common elements, you don't need to get that vote. But again, talk to your legal counsel, find out if, that, if this is something that qualifies. You can't just call something necessary maintenance to get out of getting a vote. Um, you know, so you want to make sure you're, you're doing it properly. In the world of HOAs, oftentimes you don't have any language in there. Statute doesn't say anything, so it's whatever is in your, in your governing documents. So sometimes there's a, a limitation in, in terms of the board can't spend $10,000 on a capital improvement without getting membership approval or something like that. So you want to look at your docs, make sure that if there's language in there, that's the language you want or possibly you might wanna change it, make it a little bit easier to do possible future material alterations if you think that's something that you may need in the future or that's something on the horizon for you. So look at your docs, see what your language is, 
that may be something you want to look at amending. Delinquent assessments accrue interest at the rate of 18% and a $25 late fee applies. False. And again, this is one of those where generally that's right. That is what the statutes allow for, but it's also because they allow you to charge the late fee that's in your governing documents and interest in your governing documents as provided in your governing documents. So again, if your governing documents don't either conform to the statute or sort of defer to the statute, or if they don't provide for 18% and the $25, you might be leaving money on the table. We have a lot of clients that they had old language, their documents limit their interest rate to 10%, for example. So if you're doing any amendments, this is another thing to look at. It's a small change, it change. it's a pretty easy change, but again, it gets you some more money, so hey. If a pipe in a wall only provides service to one unit, that unit's responsible for the maintenance. Obviously, this is a uh, condo question here. Sometimes true, sometimes false. The Declaration of Condominium describes the boundaries of your unit, and it's also, go also going to outline who's responsible for the maintenance of the different, different items, the different condominium property, whether it's within your unit, outside of your unit, but only services your unit, or in the common elements, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe it's just the association. So, that's something too that'll come up a lot of times in, in townhomes, for example. We have a lot of disputes about who maintains what, who maintains the roof. You know, maybe you want to switch it. Maybe that's something you want to amend. Maybe you want to look at what issues you've had in the past with owners. You want to think about doing an amendment in the future to either clarify it or to even change it. Sometimes, you know, the roofs might have been the association's responsibility and the community comes back and says, no, we want to let everybody do their own roof if we're talking about a you know, townhome situation or vice versa. It was written that the, the each individual owner is responsible for their roof and then the community says, well, it doesn't make sense. It makes more sense if the association just does it because the roofs you know, are, are connected or whatever. We want to switch it. We want to amend the docks to, to, make, you know, to suit our, our needs. And that would be a requirement. That would be an, a, an amendment requirement. All right, so wrapping up with our last thing and then we'll do a few questions here. So basically, what have we learned? Um, and let me bring up another point that I, I sort of jotted down because I knew I would, in case I didn't mention it in going through here. When we talked about in the beginning, your governing documents, your declaration, whether it be condominium or covenants, articles, bylaws, rules. Something to keep in mind with rules because we did reference them a bunch today. For your rules to be enforceable, and your rules are typically, again, adopted just by the board, but check your documents. There might be something that requires membership approval um, or an opportunity for the membership to veto a new rule or something like that. But your rules, because they are adopted typically just by the board, in order to be enforceable, they don't carry as much weight as the restrictions that are in the declaration because the declaration was, was amended, approved by, by the owners. So, for the rules to be enforceable, one of the things you have to keep in mind, it has to be a reasonable rule, which I would hope if that's something the board is considering, I would hope it would be reasonable. Typically it is. Um, that they have the authority to do it. So if you're talking about a rule that has to do with, you know, common area, pool, that type of thing, odds are you, you have that in your documents, I'm sure. But now what if it's a rule that deals with just unit use or just lot use? You want to make sure your authority covers that as well. But the one that really comes into play is if for a rule to be enforceable, it can't conflict with the restrictions that are already in the declaration. Now, if there is something that is unrestricted in the declaration or not mentioned in the declaration, it's presumed to be unrestricted. And if you try to adopt a rule to then restrict whatever that is, you may run into an enforceability issue where someone says, well, that rule is not enforceable because it conflicts with the declaration because there's no restriction in the declaration. So if you've heard your attorney tell you something like that in terms of what you have in your rules, that's another thing to look at to go, oh, wait a minute, we need an amendment to our declaration so that our rules now will make sense. And the easiest example for that is if we're talking about, you know, commercial vehicles, parking restrictions. If there's no vehicle restrictions in your declaration, if there's nothing about commercial vehicles, if there's nothing about trucks, nothing mentioned about vehicles whatsoever in your declaration and the board decides on its own 
we want to prohibit commercial vehicles or we want to prohibit trucks from being parked in our community and they put that in a rule that rule might be subject to challenge if your declaration did say something about trucks if it generally said you know no trucks allowed or no commercial vehicles allowed and then the board wanted to adopt a rule specifying well by trucks we don't mean suvs we don't mean minivans we don't mean personal use you know pickup trucks we only mean trucks in this size trucks with signs trucks with tools commercial vehicles that type of thing that would be a different story and then that would be okay so you may have to amend your declaration to make your rules effective if that makes sense so that's something to look at as well now a couple things we just touched on safe harbor you might have old language in your documents that's a hot topic you might want to look at architectural guidelines you need to account for renewable resources. These have been recent changes in the last couple of years. Um, you might be losing money from interest and late fees. Right of first refusal is different than the right of approval. Again, we talked about that a little bit, and we can talk about that in more detail in one of our sales, uh, sales and approval courses. New laws may not apply to your association depending on what language you have in your governing documents, so you wanna look at that. Old language in your documents may expose the association to discrimination claims. Like I said, if you have something in there that says no one under 15 can live here, that's not, that's not the case and that's not gonna be enforceable. All right, so let's, let's look at some Q and A. Oh, I did get some other questions too that I just wanted to touch on beforehand. And I think we went through most of them, but um, let's see, someone did ask about the rules and regulations have to be recorded. We discussed that a little bit. Um, we would suggest you do, especially in HOA world. Uh, does new code of ethics for board require an amendment? Not sure what we're, oh, do you want to adopt a new code of ethics for the board? I'm not entirely sure what that question is. Um, let's see, did you say voting rights can be suspended if one is in arrears? Yes, that is one of the things. We said, if you are delinquent 90 day, over 90 days, if you're in an HOA, if you're in a condominium, it's over 90 days and it has to be at least $1,000. And then you can vote, you can suspend voting rights. And that you also, in condo world, you have to give them proof of the debt at least 30 days before the effective date. So basically sort of give them a last chance to pay before you're gonna amend or suspend their voting rights. Um, and then yes, then you, they come out of the, the equation, if you will, for, for the math in terms of trying to figure out how many votes you need. If you're, you know, two thirds of 100, it, you know, then it's whatever it is, 67 people you need. If you suspend the voting rights of 10 people and now, now your number is 90, now you only need the two thirds of that, which, you know, now it's not the 67, now it's just, now you're down to the, at least 60. Um, let's see, executive golf course and da, 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 da. all right, 40 year inspection. Can the board use COVID situation for emergency powers to pass an assessment to address these issues? When the owners are saying this is a sizable assessment and they're claiming no money, no jobs. Okay, if I, if I understood that question correctly doesn't really have to do with amendments, but, but we'll answer it. Um, ultimately, yes, right now, because of COVID, I understand things are different, things are crazy. We get lots of questions. Can we adopt a special assessment? Should we be still collecting? What are we supposed to do? Um, like I said, we're also teaching a lot of courses just on sort of functioning during the, the COVID-19 crisis, and this is addressed in there too, but I'll, I'll mention, you know, the association needs its funds as well. The association has, has to operate, has to pay its vendors. So I understand if someone reaches out to you, you send them the notice of an assessment, they reach out to you and say, hey, I just got laid off. I need some time. I wanna work out a payment plan, whatever it is. Now that would happen you know, six months ago too, before all of this. And the board can make an exception. The board can work out a payment plan. The board can you know, waive interest if they wanted to. That's all you know, up to the board's discretion. Just because we're in this situation, the board might be a little more lenient now, but it doesn't have to be. And you could still adopt a special assessment if there is a project that you need to, to do and you need those funds, you're gonna have to adopt a special assessment. Um, let's see. Let's 
someone said, is there a way to get around where the association can't screen, can cannot screen in a lender foreclosure so the association can have some say as per the docs in a regular sale? So this is about lender foreclosure. Now, it is something you can modify. You can amend that when you're talking about being able to screen. You may be able to screen for occupancy as opposed for to just the ownership. There may be other ways to sort of work that in. Um, if you're talking about taking away the lender's right to, uh, or, or any ability to screen after a foreclosure sale, um, that may not go over some, so well with lenders who, if they look at your docs going forward and want to lend in your community. So be careful with that. Um, but you can work on an amendment to, to achieve that goal. Uh, let's see. Interviewing for what purpose other than perhaps going over rules and regulations for the interview include um, I, I'm not sure what that says docs and background checks should be able to keep out the undesirables. Okay, let me let me address that. Yes, if you want to interview typically what we tell people to avoid possible discrimination issues and, and this is again because in a vacuum, if you've already looked at an application, you've already seen their credit history, you've already seen their, their you know, criminal history, and you've already you know, checked out their references, you've done everything you're supposed to do, you've looked at the application, you're basically approving this person, last step is the interview. We like to tell you, the interview really shouldn't be an interview, it should just be sort of an orientation, go over the rules and regulations with this person, um, if you are going to change your mind at the interview, that sort of supports an argument that, well, I was approved until they saw me or until they met me. And that tends to give rise to possible discrimination issues. If you, if you, you know, have questions about an application, if you have your, your, your concerns about an application, figure those out before. Don't do the interview yet treat the interview, like I said, as an orientation where you've already decided essentially it's the last step, everything on paper looks great. We're just meeting them to, you know, explain how the pool works and what this key does and, and go through the rules and regulations. That's, um, that's a good question. Um, let's see, can an HOA board tell a seller they'll not approve an applicant because of a seller's landscape violation that has not been resolved? So that is something potentially, if an owner has violations, that is something that, that doesn't really go away, if you will, that can be included in the estoppel. It should be worked out as part of the sale. Um, otherwise, it may be carried on to the next, to the next owner and the board would have the ability to, to enforce it there. Let's see. Um, transfer fee as well as an application fee. I like where you're, where you're going with this. Can an associate condo association charge a transfer fee as well as an application fee to the buyer, $100 for each? No, this is, this is we were hoping, and, uh, but it's essentially been challenged. Transfer fee ends up being considered any fee in association with the transfer. So your application fee, any other non-refundable fee. So if you're, you're gonna charge, um, again, an application fee and a transfer fee, you're gonna be considered in violation of that statute. So be careful. Um, I, I would not do that without uh, you know, knowing that there's a risk that that may come back. And even though it's only an extra hundred bucks, if everyone in the building catches wind that you weren't supposed to be doing that, and you know, a hundred people come back to you and say, you charged me a hundred bucks too much, you may, uh, you may be dealing with an issue. Credit score, can that be used as part of the criteria? So good question. Again, that's sort of an interesting one as well, where you want to make sure that again, assuming the board is looking at, has their good cause criteria outlined, everything's in there, it should be one of the factors. So if someone has, you know, not great credit, but they're purchasing in cash, maybe you wanna reconsider and, and let them do it. Maybe the board will allow them to pay a, a year's worth of assessments up front. If they say, listen, I know my credit's not great, but I'm willing to pay you a year's worth of assessments up front, you can hold it and, uh, you know, and I'll pay going forward. And then if I ever default, you can apply, you can apply those, those funds. Um, that may be something that sort of addresses your, your, your concern there. 
Docs say two occupants max in one bedroom and the young owners have a baby. Oh, funny. Did you guys, uh, did you know that there was a case that was exactly on this issue? <laughs> um, so this is another policy where you want to be careful where you might run into discrimination issues. So, and this is a familial, uh, this is a protected class because it deals with familial status. So if you have, and there was exactly a case on this exact scenario, it was a couple and they wanted to buy a unit. It was a one bedroom unit and the, the wife was pregnant. And the docs say, you're only allowed to have two people in a bedroom. So that unfortunately has a discriminatory effect depending on how it's worded. If it's two people, two adults, you might wanna see how, how that goes. The problem is um, for occupancy purposes, even in Broward County, anyone under 10 counts as half an adult basically. So with occupancy restrictions, you have to be very careful in terms of making sure, again, it doesn't have a discriminatory effect. If you denied based on that, you might, you might run into a discrimination issue. Um, all right, I see it's already, oh, it's 209. Okay, well, we went over. Jeff, I don't know if we need to, um, what we need to do here. Let's see. Well, uh, we did go over. Anybody, if you want it, that's answering additional questions. Uh, it's, it's certainly a time issue. Anybody who needs to go can go. Um, this is not part of the, the credit. You, you, if you're here now, you received your credit. You're good to go if you need to leave the webinar. Um, thank you for attending. And Emily, um, all questions that went unanswered, you will receive, uh, the firm will receive a full report on all of the questions. You can address them via email. We have everybody's email address as well. Okay. Can I just say, because someone did ask about cost, and I just want to jump in on that. Um, go for it. Yeah, the go for method it. For, the method for amending your documents could be done sort of different ways. Like we said, typically we suggest at least step one, work on your amendment provision before you hire us to change other things because you want to make sure you're going to be able to get those changes through. So do your amendment provision first, lower that threshold, then come back for you know phase two, if you will. Um, and then when we do that, you could do it different ways. Obviously talk to your attorney. There may be just one or two changes you guys want to make, um, which could just be billed hourly and be a pretty simple thing. If you're thinking in terms of, we want to review our entire set of governing documents and we want your recommendation on every possible change we could make, that process is time consuming and it requires a lot of attorney time and a lot of, um, obviously it's very detailed. We go through your governing documents word by word and tell you, hey, Article 2, you can update this, you can take this language out, we can recommend changing this, consider doing this. That's a, a time consuming process. That's obviously a lot more expensive than doing the individual amendments. But, um, but if ultimately you are gonna make a lot of changes, it may make more sense in the long run to do sort of a whole overhaul instead of doing a piecemeal approach. So talk to your attorney. I can't really give you a ballpark there because it depends on what you need and, and how you do it. So I just wanted to touch on that because I know that was one of the questions I got beforehand too. So go ahead, Jeff. Oh, uh, that's, we're, thanks so much for attending. Great job as usual. Um, and again, just, just in case you uh, didn't hear me the first time, you will, your questions will be addressed if they didn't get answered live on the air or typed in. A recording of this presentation will be on our website in a few days under the resources tab. And be sure to uh, fill out the evaluation. That's how you get your attendance certificates and your CAM CE credit if you're a CAM. We know the deadline's coming up. If you phoned in, be on the lookout for that email tomorrow. That's where the link for the evaluation will appear. Thanks very much, and we will thank you guys see you virtually next time. Don't worry, we don't, we can't really see you, so don't worry. We'll see, <laughs> see you next time. Take care, everybody. It's so weird when I can't see them. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, bye.